Great. Um, look, thank you, uh, Jeff, for that introduction. And um, also, I'm not sure we can see him here. I'm sure he's here somewhere. But um, thank you particularly for Fran uh, for inviting me to speak today. And also like to thank Fran for his, there he is, um, for his courage and vision in setting up and running this conference. I think for those of us, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> For those of us who have been involved in conferences before, it's an incredibly stressful exercise, and so um, thank you, Fran, for, for doing this. Um, look, I'm here to speak today about the legal and regulatory landscape in New Zealand. Now, un unfortunately, the legal and regulatory landscape in New Zealand is not like that, clear and beautiful. Um, and in fact, if I had my time again and was um, preparing this first slide, it would probably have been a dense fog and you probably wouldn't have even been able to see the title. Um, look, as uh, Jeff said, I, I am um, a payments lawyer. Um, up until two or three years ago, um, payments lawyers didn't exist, uh, which I think is a reflection of the fact that um, there has been such dramatic change in the payment system over the last two or three years. Um, my history is, has been very much acting for uh, what I think Andreas would have termed the gatekeepers, um, the central banks, the governments, the banks. Um, I am very much a digital immigrant, uh, learning this stuff, and I'm heavily dependent, for example, on my colleague Katie, who's down the back there, um, for her enduring patience and trying to teach me the culture and language of the new digital world. Um, but <clears throat> Whether you like it or not, um, it is people of my generation that wrote the rules that you're working in now, um, and probably in the foreseeable future might continue to, to write the rules in relation to how Bitcoin works. Um, from what I can tell, as, as I say, very much a digital immigrant about um, Bitcoin and the blockchain and having listened this morning and having done a bit of work over the last 12 months in relation to it, is there are probably a couple of things that strike me about it. The first is there seems to be a general acceptance that the blockchain is robust, breakthrough, possibly revolutionary technology that does allow secure, cheap and quick transfer of value. Um, as Andreas was saying this morning, possibly the zero cost transfer for money system. Um, but and there is a big but. It has a big stigma. And it has a big stigma for what I can tell, from what I can tell, two reasons. Um, it is perceived as an easy way to uh, avoid tax and an easy way to launder money. Now, what's interesting about that to me, um, again, probably as a conventional payments lawyer, is that um, Her Majesty the Queen's preferred payment instrument, um, cash, is equally able to be used to launder money and evade tax. And um, at this stage, at least, um, as far as I'm aware, nobody has suggested that every time the Reserve Bank issue cash, they need to do customer due diligence. Um, and nor am I aware at the moment of anybody talking about refusing to deal with the Reserve Bank of New Zealand because it is an inadequate customer due diligence um, steps in place. Um, as far as I'm aware, most of the banks continue to, to be more than happy to deal with the Reserve Bank. Um, so with that introduction, um, just an over overview of um, what I plan to deal with today. Um, the first, and I'll try and keep my presentation to 20 minutes, and I think um, Fran has been pretty good at keeping people to time, so um, hopefully we'll keep to, to 20 minutes so there can be a few questions in the end. But what I'd like to deal with is, you know, what is Bitcoin? Um, and that's not as what is Bitcoin as you guys might know what is Bitcoin. It's from the legal point of view, what is Bitcoin? Um, and then I think from, from what I can tell, the two big issues that people have in relation to, but certainly in New Zealand in relation to Bitcoin is, how is it taxed? Um, and what do you need to do to comply with your anti-money laundering obligations? I'm also going to address securities law, which is less of an issue for Bitcoin, but is conventionally the starting point for a lot of the new payment systems. And you know, I've done a lot of work for even people like Apple, Visa, um, Disney, and smaller entrepreneurs on their own usually closed loop payment systems. And the securities law is always the starting point for that. Um, and then lastly, if we've got a bit of time, sort of try and apply it across peer-to-peer -peer transactions, ATMs, exchanges and how the law might apply. Um, 
But uh, as I said, the starting point for um, any legal analysis um, for Bitcoin is what is it legally? And um, that is, to me at least, and I'm sure from what I can tell um, to lawyers around the world, quite a challenge. Um, Chris Skinner, who spoke at um, Steve Wiggins' payments conference a couple of weeks ago and is widely acknowledged as one of the leading world experts in digital banking, described um, Bitcoin and the blockchain as, and I quote, a protocol, a commodity, a technology, a smart contract system, a general ledger, a secure exchange, a many splendid thing. Um, so great, but how does that fit um, with how the law might look at the blockchain and Bitcoin is. So I start with a multi-choice question. So just interested, quick show of hands um, um, as a starting point. And we've had some people like Andreas, I think, probably throw something into the mix already. How many people think that the Bitcoin is most like a currency? A few? A few? Yeah. Who think it's most like a commodity? About the same, maybe. So. OK, a security? Well, we've got one of those, okay. A payment system. Yeah, okay, quite a few, the payment system. And then E, all of the above. Okay, so it seems to be all of the above seems to be winning. Well, um, if you watch TV, and I still do watch TV, I don't use YouTube or, um, or, or pirate um, US TV shows, um, the answer is apparently very easy. I don't know whether any of you watched The, the Good Wife, but um, there was a, a, a series, actually just a couple of weeks ago, screened here in New Zealand called uh, Bitcoin for Dummies. Um, and this is a scene from... Alex there. Krakowski. I'm the manager of the Crestview Priority. And you rented Mr. Tambor the room in question? That's correct. This hotel room is taking on legendary status. And you accepted his Bitcoin? Yeah. It's a promotion, so... Uh, yeah. And you would also have accepted his frequent travel miles in trade for the room? Yeah. We have a promotion going. Priority in frequent travel miles. But you don't consider frequent travel miles cash. What do you mean? I mean, you have a cash register with a drawer for cash. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> we don't have a drawer for Bitcoin or frequent travel miles. So it's more like a trade. Trading frequent travel miles for the room. Uh, yeah. In other words, it's a commodity, not a currency. Yeah, and we're not going to do it much more with Bitcoin. I thought it would be cool, but it's a bit of a hassle. Thank you. No further questions. Good morning, Mr. Krakowski. If you wanted to purchase a book on Amazon, could you do it using the frequent travel miles you accept at your hotel? Could I do it? No, I don't think so. Because they're not transferable? Yeah, that's right. It says right But on. you could buy a book on Amazon with the cash from your cash drawer? Well, no, you'd have to do it with a credit card or something. But you could also buy the book with Bitcoin, could you not? Yeah, I think that's right. Because Bitcoin is transferable and therefore a currency. Okay. I get it. You know, I'd love to hear more about this saga of the Priority Inn in Crestview, but I'm ready to rule. Bitcoin is a currency. Okay, it's easy, right? It's a currency. Well, um, if only it really was that easy. Um, whoops, we go back a step. Um, then, Alex. Right. Um, so look, in New Zealand, is it a currency or, or not? Um, and what I thought I'd do is just give you a quick summary of um, how some of our regulators look at Bitcoin. Now, the IRD, um, for those from overseas, that's our tax um, authority, um, have said, look, yeah, actually, we sort of think it is a currency for some purposes, but maybe not for others. I mean, actually, they've said very little, but... Um, um, so if you trade um, in bitcoins, you make profit from sale of bitcoins, it's like a currency, foreign currency trading. The Reserve Bank, on the other hand, have said, no, nah, it's not a currency. Um, and um, if we go back from a legal point of view, go back to the earlier um, slide of um, what is it most like. Um, in New Zealand, the only person that can issue a currency, issue currency is the Reserve Bank. Um, back in history, banks used to be able to, but it's now only the Reserve Bank. And the only thing that you are compelled to take in satisfaction of a debt is legal tender. Her Majesty the Queen's cash and coins. Um, you're not compelled to take Bitcoin um, in discharge of a debt. So um, the Reserve Bank say it's definitely not a currency. 
Um, by implication, and we'll get on to this, the Department of Internal Affairs and Reserve Bank, who, are, who both are New Zealand, and we have too many of these, but both administer anti-money laundering legislation, are probably saying we think it is actually a payment system. Um, and probably if you look at the definition in the Reserve Bank Act of a payment system, it probably is. Um, as a payments lawyer, um, it has all of the features. It has um, the instruction um, that you give. You know, and that might be, we heard this morning, you know, 15 smiley faces. Um, that's the instruction you give. It has a way of authenticating that instruction, and it has a way of transferring value. Um, as, a, as I say, a conventional payments lawyer, those are the key elements of a payment system. What, what it's missing, but you don't have to have it, is the banks in the middle. Um, and then lastly, in New Zealand, the Financial Markets Authority that govern our securities legislation, um, we don't know what they think yet, and it certainly doesn't seem to be something that they're particularly thinking about. And lastly, even though they're not regulators, um, they do have an influence, and we will talk about, I will talk about them a little bit later, but the banks. Banks in New Zealand, um, they don't really know what to think. In fact, they're probably burying their heads in the sand a bit, going, oh, it's just too hard, too risky, don't want to know. Um, so just an, an overview of how the regulators think about it. Um, so going quickly through these uh, questions, I've said, it, it actually in New Zealand it isn't a currency because the Reserve Bank is the only one that can. Um, it does have a lot of the features, and we'll talk about it, of a commodity, gold or diamonds. Um, as an exchange, you mine it, you can exchange it. Um, a security, like a bank account, um, you, you, it does have an account embedded in it, but actually there's no issuer, so it's not a security. Um, a payment system, as I've said before, I think um, it does have a lot of the features of a payment system. Okay then, so moving on to the first um, <coughs> of what I understand to be one of the issues that a number of the, block, block, the um, Bitcoin community in New Zealand have in relation um, to how it's, well, one of the legal issues they have is, is how, how it's dealt with for tax. Um, now, Tax, so as I said at the outset of this, you know, I, I would say, look, this is, we're not dealing with a picturesque landscape, we're dealing with a dense fog. Tax, to me, you, know, you start with a fog, it's, it, all tax is a fog. Um, this is probably in some areas more like a whiteout, um, although um, there are some elements of tax, I think, which are not that hard. Um, and the first element of it is, if you're dealing in bitcoins, if you're buying and selling them, and you're making money out of them, it's taxable. No different from buying and selling foreign currency, buying and selling any commodity. If you're buying and selling it and you're making money, it's taxable. Second, um, very basic um, and nothing too controversial about it, is if you're accepting um, bitcoins in exchange for services, you can't avoid GST on the basis that you took a bitcoin instead of a dollar. You have to convert it to New Zealand dollars and 15% of it goes to the government. Um, Neither of those things, to me, are particularly exceptional. However, where the fog descends and where it gets hard is in relation to GST generally. Um, if you're mining bitcoins, there is an argument that, that when you mine and you get bitcoins, you have to pay GST on the value of the bitcoins that you've mined. Interestingly, in the GST Act, there is a specific exemption for mining of gold and silver, or fine metals. It basically says you don't have to pay GST if you mine gold or silver and you refine it. The first person that does that doesn't pay GST. But clearly, because that was written before bitcoins were even thought of, um, it doesn't apply necessarily to bitcoins. So there is a danger that if you're mining bitcoins, you have to pay GST on the bitcoins that you've mined. Secondly, if you're dispensing bitcoins because they are probably a commodity, they're not a security, and they're not within any of the definitions of um, financial instruments or security, if you're selling them through an ATM and you're doing more than, I think it's 42,000 when you need to register for GST, GST is payable on the um, bitcoins that you sell. So it's just like selling grain or gold or silver or any commodity, if you sell it um, and it's not an exempt supply, you pay GST, or you, you've got to charge GST on it. So you either have to absorb the GST yourself or charge the customer GST for it. Um, it's just not simply dealt with in um, the legislation. And then lastly, the example I'll give, which is, um, I think, where some of the complexity happens, but you know, let's say we use the example of a law firm and we use Fran as a client. Um, you know, we provide services to um, as a client, 
thousand dollars worth of services because we've done a, done them a cheap deal. Uh, hundred and fifty dollars worth of GST on those services. He wants to pay us in Bitcoin. Um, we're happy to accept Bitcoin. Um, the nature of the arrangement, um, and again the IRD haven't said anything about this, but we think the nature of the arrangement is like a barter. So he pays us oops, sorry, the equivalent in bit of value in value of um, $1,050 of Bitcoins. We have to account in this instance here to the $150 of GST um, to the in our revenue department, but we've also got $150 worth of GST which Fran has had to charge us on the bitcoins that, so that he's supplied us. So we'll, we'll have an input tax credit of the $150 worth of bitcoins that we've got, so we're net neutral. Um, Fran will be the same. Um, he's got 100, uh, um, $150 worth of GST he needs to pay in relation to the bitcoins he's supplied us, but he can get a GST credit back for the $150 that he's paid in GST to us. So he's net neutral, but he's got a compliance cost. He's got to register for GST, um, and he's got to account for inputs and outputs. Where it gets difficult then is that, you know, when we've got, we the law firm, have got the bitcoins and then we want to go and sell them, we've probably got to uh, absorb the GST on the bitcoins that we've then in turn sold because we're registered for GST. So until, as long as the, there is a reasonable risk, and certainly when you look at the GST Act, it is not the bitcoins and are not an exempt supply, as long as it's potentially treated by the um, Inland Revenue Department as a commodity, you've potentially got GST leakage, which you would not have on a conventional currency. So moving from tax into anti-money laundering, um, in relation to anti-money laundering, our starting point is that we don't, well, certainly there is no issue for peer-to-peer -peer transactions, it's just not caught. Um, but where you do get into potentially having to comply with anti-money laundering um, legislation in relation to bitcoins um, is in relation to ATM transactions and almost certainly in exchange. Um, now, while we think the, the definition which catches you, there's quite a wide definition of who is a reporting entity um, and what is a financial institution, the part of the definition that could get you is issuing or managing a means of payment. Now, personally, we don't think that um, if you're operating an ATM, you are actually managing a means of payment. You're just simply selling and receiving. Um, there is an argument if you're mining that you may be, because you're checking the blockchain, you be, may, may well be managing a means of payment. Certainly, again, depending on how your exchange is set up, you may well be managing a means of payment. But even if we're right, and we think we are, um, it's clear that the Reserve Bank and um, Department of Internal Affairs believe that the anti-money laundering legislation does apply to people operating ATMs. Haven't, I don't know where they've, but I'm sure they've said the same in relation to exchanges. So what does that mean? Ultimately, what that means is that you have to have an AML anti-money laundering compliance program. Now, that's not necessarily, and I, know, I think, Jonathan, you've got one. Um, I don't know that they're that hard. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you have to do a risk assessment, and presumably, if you're running ATMs or something, there are people who have done those sorts of things to copy off. You need to have an anti-money laundering officer. Well, anybody can be that, so that's no great hardship. And then you have to report suspicious transactions. Where it gets tough, um, and where the rubber hits the road a little bit is if you ever end up needing to do customer due diligence. Now, if you're running just an, a Bitcoin ATM, uh, we don't think you do. You need to have a business relationship with somebody, and you, I don't think you can have a business relationship typically with someone who's just coming in and taking the Bitcoin, giving you cash, and moving on. Um, there may be a point at which that becomes a business relationship, but in general, we don't think you need to. However, um, and this is the same with Her Majesty the Queen with, it, with her currency, if, if you do more than $10,000 worth of transaction as an occasional transaction, it is separately caught. So if you've got someone and you want to trade more than $10,000, um, then you're caught and you need to do customer due diligence on that person. So in terms of you know, what's the outcome of that from a New Zealand legal point of view, um, 
the sensible thing is to have, if you're, if you're running an ATM or an exchange at least, is to have a compliance program. Probably not that hard. Um, there's no point probably taking on the Reserve Bank and Department of Internal Affairs. Ultimately, they can designate you if, they, if they've got it wrong. But then you've still got a problem. Um, and the problem is the banks. As far as I can tell, most, if not all, of the New Zealand banks have said they don't want to bank Bitcoin operators. Um, and interestingly, the same problem, it's not confined to Bitcoin operators either. Um, there is a real problem emerging because the New Zealand banks, um, and actually not just New Zealand banks, are refusing to bank money remittance transfer services. Now these are the sorts of services that in a country like New Zealand, for example, have proliferated that have helped people, but particularly islanders, send money back to the islands. Um, the banks have said, well look, we just can't verify the identity of the person that's you know, remitting it or at the other end, we think we need to have a look, look through process with you so that we look through and have to do customer due diligence on your customers. All too hard, not doing it, we don't have to bank you. Um, and that's been their attitude. Interestingly, just last week in Australia, Westpac ended up being sued by a group of money um, remitters um, who closed their bank accounts down saying that they acted unconscionably. Now, whether that kind of option is open to people in the Bitcoin or Bitcoin and money remitted communities in relation to um, New Zealand banks, I don't know. Um, it is, however, clear that the Reserve Bank in New Zealand know that it's a problem, not from a Bitcoin point of view, although Bitcoin equally is a, would be a good way of transmitting money back to a lot of the poorer countries. I mean, the same thing happened in the US, in the UK rather, with uh, money going to Somalia, and there was an injunction against Barclays Bank in relation to that as well. Um, but the Reserve Bank here do know, and as do, do Austrac, who's the um, anti-money laundering um, organisation in Australia, know it is an issue, um, and are trying to find a way to persuade the banks to do a proper risk assessment and say, look, you can do enough of a risk assessment. If these guys have got a satisfactory anti-money laundering programme, you should be able to bank them. But at the moment, even if you get through all of that, you may well find you just can't open a bank account. So if you need the banks, um, it's still a problem. Um, I'll talk about securities law, um, but really probably just as an overview because it just doesn't apply, um, I don't believe to, uh, it probably doesn't, it almost certainly doesn't apply to Bitcoin, but it is the way you typically start for, as I say, for the likes of an Apple or a Google or is typically, have, are you issuing a security? And in fact there was a paper done recently um, by an academic out of the Hawke's Bay, I think, which said that actually in New Zealand, Bitcoin should be regulated by the Financial Markets Authority, that the risks and, and issues in dealing with Bitcoin are not adequately disclosed, there need to be, need to be a way of forcing the community to make better disclosure um, of uh, Bitcoin and the risks and issues with Bitcoin. However, and this is, you know, appears everywhere with Bitcoin, because there is no single issuer it's a great network, who do you enforce it against? Who makes the disclosure? Um, there really just is nobody. It's a problem that just um, doesn't fit. Um, the last thing that I will mention, and it actually was mentioned to me, I think Dave in the cab on the way in as well, financial service providers legislation. Um, if you've got an, an anti-money laundering program, you've probably accepted that you're managing a means of payment. That also requires you to register as a financial service provider in New Zealand. Now the, the interesting thing about that is it costs you just over $500 to do that and there are no compliance obligations. Um, and in fact we've seen one of the great criticisms of it is people use it as a sort of a credibility. I'm a registered financial service provider in New Zealand. Um, actually you've got to join a dispute resolution scheme as well. So you, I've joined a dispute resolution scheme, I'm a financial services provider but I don't have to comply with anything. Um, so it costs you about $550, you don't have to comply with anything and you can call yourself a financial services provider and in fact you might have to. Um, so that's securities legislation. I will skip through the next slide which was just trying to look at how things this might apply to peer-to-peer -to -peer transactions, to um, ATMs and exchanges. I've sort of tried to do that as I've gone. Um, exchanges will be a little bit more problematic, but again, um, because you, if you're not dealing in securities, it may be relatively unregulated to set up an exchange in New Zealand. So just finished before hopefully giving a, a little bit of time for questions with a quote from a guy called Glenn Davies who wrote um, a book called The History of Money. 
And he said that he wrote this in 2005, and he said, around the next corner, um, there may be lying in wait apparently quite novel problems which in all probability bear a basic similarity to those which we have already, ta have already been tackled with varying degrees of success or failure in other times and other places. I suspect if he was writing that again with Bitcoin, <laughs> he might have just stopped with a full stop after novel problems. Um, because the fact that it is a distributed network, there is no issuer, it doesn't have similarities to a security, it doesn't have similarities to a current, well it does have similarities, but it doesn't, again with a currency, there is you know, fiat currency at least, there is an issuer, and in fact most other currencies, whether they be air miles, which we said about earlier, there is still an issuer of them. There is no issuer for Bitcoin, hey. it's a distributed network. Yep. <laughs> um, it is probably a payment on. system, but it's a payment system like none we've seen before. So look, thank you. Um, I have three or four minutes to I Fran for questions, if anybody's got any questions. Thank you, Simon. Um, there's quite a few real estate agents interested in using the promotional power of Bitcoin to attract buyers from overseas for purchasing land or property here in Queenstown. Um, and elsewhere in the country. Uh, we've had many conversations with different um, agents and the question lies, when does the consideration happen that the title can transfer? Uh, I'd be quite interested to know is it when there's six confirmations on the blockchain network and therefore consideration is met and the title can be transferred or must that Bitcoin be uh, liquidated to fiat before the title for property or other large asset can be transferred? Um, it's a good question. Um, ultimately, it's a question of contract. Um, and if I use something which <laughs> ended up being a bit harder than I would have liked it to have been with the banks, um, with the FPOS network, where we tried to say to them, and, and eventually they agreed, is that you should accept that the point at which the money title transfers is at the terminal. So you cannot reverse, once it's been accepted at the terminal, you cannot reverse the transaction and value is passed. So if you look at it in payments terms, yep. what's happened at that point is yep. the it's merchant has sold yeah. something, they can't go and get it back on the basis that the transaction bounced, they've sold it, and the merchant then is taking a risk against its bank who owes it the money. Um, that is done effectively by contract. In a conventional payments terms, um, applying the sort of rules that we try and apply to payment systems here, I would say it's when it's been authenticated and transferred in the blockchain. That's when the value has transferred. If, if by contract people say, well actually well, I'm not dealing in bitcoins, I'm actually really ultimately dealing in US dollars or Kiwi dollars so I want another step, it's only when I've got the clear title to that and the banks have given me cleared funds, then that's fine. But, but ultimately that is a, just simply a matter of contract. So the real estate agent can say, look as soon as that the blockchain, it's been verified and it's transferred, the title can pass. I've got that Bitcoin. And then I have to take the exchange risk or whatever other risks following that. Yeah. Um, at the end there is. At the very end, I think if we use the example that, that I gave, um, Mostly it's neutral because you get an input tax and an output tax, but ultimately the whole way GST works is that the ultimate consumer has paid a GST and they don't have, because they're not registered, they don't have the ability to get the input tax back. So ultimately, yes, um, as long as you're dealing between people who are registered for GST, it's neutral, but the minute it goes outside that system and I sell it to you and you're not registered um, and I want GST from you, then there is a a 15% impost effectively Which on it. Wouldn't apply with, that wouldn't apply with ordinary currency, right? It would not, but it would apply to gold. To gold or diamonds. So, you know, if you, if you liken them to gold or diamonds, if I'm buying diamonds, ultimately the final recipient of the final purchaser of diamonds pays the 15%, which is why I think when I went back it's actually more like, in terms of currently the way it's treated, it's more like a commodity than a currency. So has that had any impact as far as you can see on the potential adoption of Bitcoin in New Zealand? 
Look, I don't think that... I think the issue is that it hasn't really been thought about. The ATO in Australia have, and I don't... It may have been an issue in Australia. I just don't... Th the, in fact, the, the Inland Revenue Department here have said it's just not on our work programme yet. It's not important enough. There's not enough value transferring. So I don't know that it has, because I don't know anybody, even the, the IRD, has particularly thought about it. Excuse me? Someone can prove me wrong on that. So. Uh, what about... What about for nonprofit or charity groups issuing Bitcoin or similar digital currencies as payment s systems? Would they need to pay I, uh, the 15% GST, or would they be exempt by this, held by the same limits? Um, look, I'm not sure. That some charities, might, I mean, certainly charities are exempt for tax. They may not be necessarily exempt from GST. I'd have to I'd look. I'd have to take that on notice. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.